So I guess we can start. Um, I have an important announcement to make. Uh, this Friday I'll be going to North Carolina State University for some talk, so I won't be able to be in the classroom. What I'm going to do is I'll record a lecture and I'll upload it on YouTube, and so you can look at it at a later time. Uh, so Friday there is no class, but I will be uploading a lecture to compensate for the missed class. Um, the goal for today's lecture is to talk about penalty methods. The idea in penalty method is similar to the other two ideas we talked about, which is augmented Lagrangian method and barrier method. So in penalty method, you come up with a penalty function. So you have the original constraint optimization problem. So minimize f of x. You have this optimization problem. You want to transform this problem into an unconstrained problem or of some p tilde of x. So this is the penalty function. So we tried to do that in the augmented Lagrangian uh, method. Uh, and we also tried to do that in the case of barrier method. And we are trying to do something very similar in today's class as well. So I want to convert the original, uh, original constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem with penalty for violating the constraint or, or some complicated forms of penalty. Uh, so that if I compute a stationary point here, it should probably correspond to the minimum of this particular optimization problem. That's our goal. Now let's try to come up with a very stupid penalty function and then to try to argue why that penalty function seems stupid and then we'll come up with a more intelligent penalty function and try to study the properties of optimizing that penalty function. And which would lead to a class of algorithms known as sequential quadratic programming and if you will work in embedded optimization in the future, which means optimization in embedded systems, so you will build a controller for a wind power plant, which is going to sit inside the wind turbine, you will be using sequential quadratic programming for writing those kind of codes. So SQP, sequential quadratic program, which is what we will talk about in today's class and in the subsequent class, it's a very, very versatile algorithm, very robust algorithm. And it's a very useful algorithm to implement if you are going to do optimization on an embedded device. An embedded device means it has to be a small microcontroller, like what's there in a thermostat or what's there in maybe a wind, power, wind farm, wind turbine, a controller for the wind turbine. Or it could be another embedded device which would sit in your car engine and is trying to optimize for emissions or something like that. So those are all situations where your processor is not very powerful, uh, but you still want to run some optimization on top of it. So then sequential quadratic programming turns out to be a very good algorithm for that, which is what we are studying today. So among you, whoever are embedded systems people, uh, this, these two lectures are for you specifically. All right. <clears throat> So here is the deal. So I can define my Lagrangian mu as f of x plus lambda transpose h of x plus mu transpose g of x. And I know that our optimal solution, x star, lambda star, mu star, I know that my first derivative of x star lambda star mu star is equal to 0. And my max of 0 dj x star is equal to 0.
Of course, h of x star is also equal to 0. So I know these properties that needs to be satisfied by an optimal solution, x star, which is a regular point. How should we come up with a penalty function whose minimum would correspond to these, this solution? What should we do? So I have, uh, how many equations I have? I have n plus m plus n, n plus m plus r equations and I have n plus m plus r number of unknowns. So I have, I have the same number of equations and the same number of unknowns. So I have like a sequence of equations. I need to find a point which satisfies all three equations simultaneously. What, should you, what would you do if you wanted to do that? It's like finding roots of a polynomial, right? It's a very similar problem. So how would you try to come up with an objective function whose unconstrained minimum may correspond to this solution? Any thoughts? Let me make a, a, a slightly easier statement. So I have a polynomial P of x. I want to find the roots of this polynomial. How can I, well, p of x, okay, maybe polynomial, I need some other function, a of x. I think a is fine, a is not used anywhere. Okay, so I have a polynomial a of x, and I want to find the roots of the polynomial. I just want to find one root. I don't care about 200 roots of the polynomial. I just want to get one root of this polynomial. How would you transform this problem into an optimization problem? How about the following? I want to minimize x in Rn, a square x. Maybe I'll put a half here. Right, so if I solve this problem, the solution to that would correspond to the root of this particular equation, right? So this is always non-zero. This is always greater than, I mean, the objective function is always greater than or equal to zero. And so if I'm solving for the minimum, uh, the minimum value is going to be equal to zero and that x star would correspond to a point where a x star is equal to zero, okay? Okay, so now that you know that, how do I solve these set of equations? Any thoughts? So I have to find the roots of this sequence of, may not be polynomial, but some functions. So here is what I will do. I will minimize x in Rn, lambda in Rm, mu in Rr, <coughs> mu greater than equal to zero, gradient of x L square plus norm of h square plus summation max of zero gi of x square i equals one to r gj. I'll just convert it into an unconstrained optimization problem and I'll try to find the minimum point of this particular objective function. So this is my p tilde of x.
What is the problem with this approach? I took the first order necessary conditions for optimality. I took the norm of that sequence of equations. And I'm trying to minimize over all the parameters that affects the objective function. Actually, I shouldn't write p tilde of x because it also depends on lambda and mu. So my question is, what is wrong with this approach? Why is this a bad approach? Anyone has any thoughts on that? We're interested in x and problem. Right. So probably this will return lambda and mu. So here is here is the way to think about it. So these this is the first order necessary condition for optimality, right? We all know that. Now let me change this minimization problem to maximization problem. Or alternatively, uh, minimization of minus fx. Well, actually, I wouldn't write minimization of minus fx. I'll just write it as maximization. OK? It turns out that the first order necessary condition for this problem is exactly the same. Because the devil is in the second order necessary condition, not the first order necessary condition. So if I instead write maximization of the function subject to all these constraints, it also has the same set of FONC, just like in the case of um, uh, the first order necessary condition for unconstrained optimization. The necessary conditions for maximization is the same as necessary condition for minimization, which is that the derivative has to be equal to 0. The first derivative has to be equal to 0. It's only in the second order necessary condition where things change. And you had seen this in your assignment one problem number three, where you had two, two points that satisfied the first order necessary conditions for optimality. One was a maxima and the other one was a minima. Remember that transmission, whatever the signal to noise ratio assignment problem, right? So that is exactly the issue that's happening here. I took the first order necessary conditions for optimality I came up with a penalty function uh, thinking about this particular, uh, like I, I know about this approach. Uh, this approach was something that, if, if I'm not wrong, Newton actually tried to come up with a root finding algorithm using this approach back in 1600s. Uh, but I may be wrong about that part of history. I, I don't, I'm not a historian for 1600, what happened in 1600. But anyways, that's what Newton's approach was all about for finding roots of the polynomial. And I just used this idea that I had from 1680. I used it for my optimization problem, only to realize that actually this FONC is also FONC for the maximization problem. And therefore, if I solve this problem, I may get a point that is a minimum, but I may also get a point that is a maximum. Okay, And there is no way for me to distinguish between the two approaches. So that's why this penalty function is not really a good penalty function, because there is no way for me to differentiate. Even if I get a solution, there is no way for me to differentiate between what is a minimum and what is a maximum. So I have to come up with a more intelligent penalty function so that I can make that differentiation. I want to solve this minimization problem for the penalty function so that the optimal solution here corresponds to the optimal solution for the minimum problem. OK? So let's try to do that. Any questions on this before I raise? No?
So I'm going to make a couple of changes to the optimization formulation. So remember that I have this minimization for hx equal to 0 and gx less than equal to 0. I can write it as I want to minimize the function fx such that hx is less than equal to 0 minus hx is less than equal to 0 and gx is less than equal to 0. Right? I can always write my optimization problem in this fashion. So now I have an optimization problem with a bunch of inequality constraints. Okay? I don't have any equality constraints anymore. I have only inequality constraints in my new optimization formulation. Yes, please. Right, so that means that h of x is equal to 0. Mm -hmm. Right, so I've just split this particular equality constraints into two inequality constraints. Okay? So what I'm going to do next is I'm only going to consider problems with inequality constraints because if I have equality constraint, I can just convert it into inequality constraints and I can consider that optimization problem. So, without loss of generality, I want to minimize the function fx such that g of x is less than or equal to 0. Okay. So what is the theorem? We consider this problem, let's say my x star is optimal solution, x star is minimum, mu star is the Lagrange multiplier, And I'm going to assume that second order sufficient condition holds. I'm going to define a function p of x So I have the optimization problem, I have the optimal solution, the Lagrange multiplier pair, I'm going to assume that the second order sufficiency condition holds. And I'm going to define a function p of x, which is max, max of 0 comma g1 of x all the way to gr of x. This 0 actually comes from here, so it's the same 0 <coughs> that you see in this max. Now if any of the constraints are violated, so if any of the constraint is greater than zero, this penalty function will become positive, right? Okay. Now, I want to solve uh, minimization of fx plus c, capital P of x, where x is in Rn. And let me call this as x star, which is my optimal solution here. And let me call this y star, which is, oh, this should be argument. And the same thing here, argument. So I'm looking at the optimal solution to this optimization problem. So this would be my p tilde of x, this 
composite function, fx plus cpx. That's my p tilde, that's my penalty function. So what is the theorem? The theorem says, if c is greater than summation of mu j star, j equals 1 to r, then y star equals to x star. If I pick sufficiently large value of c, then the optimal solution to the penalty, the optimization problem corresponding to the penalty function is the same as the optimal solution to the original optimization problem I wanted to solve. Okay, so contrast that result, this result, which says that there is an equivalence between the set of optimal solutions to the two optimization problems with respect to this one where there is, was no such equivalence, where the maximum solution, maximizing solution also satisfied, uh, was also a solution to this particular optimization problem. And therefore it was meaningless. Using this penalty function was kind of meaningless because Minimum as well as maximum would satisfy the same set of conditions. On the other hand here, we have made some stringent assumptions. The stringent assumption is the second order sufficient condition holds for this optimization problem. Uh, that's a stringent assumption. Uh, then by picking C sufficiently large, I can guarantee that Y star is equal to X star. So that is the beauty of this particular penalty function. Now that we have a beautiful result, I am sure the beautiful result will have some caveat or there would be a problem with this result. What is the problem? So I have a constrained optimization problem. I transformed it into an unconstrained optimization problem, but there is a cost that I'm paying. What's that cost? Still okay. the assumptions hold? Yeah, the assumptions are holding, of course. But there's, a, there's some other problem. So let me rephrase the question. So I have this optimization problem, and I want to run gradient descent approach to solve this optimization problem. Uh, what is stopping me from using gradient descent here? Yes? P of X. P of X. So what's, what's wrong with P of X? It's max. So? Is it not differentiable? Not differentiable. So because you are taking max of differentiable function, the max operator, so even though each of these functions individually are completely differentiable, by putting a max operator on top, you have converted these differentiable functions into a non-differentiable function, okay? And that becomes a problem. So what do we do? Well, the approach that we are going to adopt is, so let's think about what's the notion of gradient or, or, or how do we use gradient in our gradient descent technique. So let's, let's go back to our uh, maybe lecture number five or six. So I had f of x and I wanted to find d or I had, so, sorry, I had x of k. <coughs> and I want to find d of k such that f of xk plus alpha dk is less than, or alpha k dk is less than f of xk <coughs> for sufficiently small values of alpha k. That's what we wanted to do in our lecture five or lecture six. And it just so happens that by picking dk to be equals to minus gradient of f xk, we were able to get that 
we, we were able to satisfy this condition for sufficiently small values of alpha k. So what that points us is perhaps there is a way to compute that dk so that this condition holds for this particular objective function. So we just want to find a dk doesn't have to be the gradient because I know that the gradient doesn't exist. All I want to do is find a dk that satisfies this particular condition for sufficiently small values of alpha k. Okay, that's the workaround that we need to think about. Okay, so here is what we will do. In order to compute the expression for fxk plus alpha k dk, so remember, I'm, I'm trying to abuse the notation. So here, this is my fxk, fx plus cpx is my is my unconstrained objective function. So let me, what should I, oh, okay, doesn't matter. So this is, I want to know what is the first derivative equivalent for this particular non-differentiable function, okay? So let's work on that. Okay, so I have, f of x plus alpha d is equal to f of x plus alpha gradient of f of x transpose d plus small o of alpha. And I have gj of x plus alpha d equals to gj of x plus alpha gradient of gj of x transpose d plus small o of alpha. And if alpha is very small, then small o of alpha is very, very small. Let me define another set of indices, j of x, which is j in 1 to r, such that p of x equals to gj of x. <coughs> so those are the set of indices that where the penalty function is equal to the inequality constraint function. Okay, everything clear so far? Okay, so we have set up the notation. Now let's consider alpha greater than zero and d in Rn, and j in capital J of x. So I have fx plus alpha d plus c px plus alpha d is equal to, oh, I shouldn't write uh, px, I should just write gj of x. I can exactly copy and paste the same equation. So I have fx plus c djx plus alpha that's what I get.
Okay. So what is fx plus alpha d plus c px plus alpha d? This is equal to fx plus alpha d plus c max over j in capital Jx dj of x plus alpha dj of x plus alpha d. Okay, so I'm removing all the indices that are not tight at that moment, and I'm only keeping the indices that are tight at the moment. Tight means the penalty function is equal to dj of x. So this f doesn't depend on j, so I can push it inside the maximum because it doesn't really affect anything. It's not a function of j. missing a C here. Please make that correction. Okay. Yes, please. Shouldn't it be grade G transpose D? Oh yeah, of course. Thank you. That's right. Okay. Looks correct. Did should there be an alpha here? Oh there should be an alpha here and there should be an alpha here. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I think everything is fine. Now I'm going to push this part. So this part is independent of J. This part depends on J. And this part is uh, very, very small, negligibly small. So I'm going to ignore this part and push it outside the maximization. This part is independent of j, so I'm going to push it out of the maximization. And I have f of x plus alpha max over j in jx. Oh, there should be a c in front. Okay. I think everything is correct so far. So now I'm going to define a quantity 
where should I erase? Maybe I should erase this file. So I'm still trying to figure out what the first derivative equivalent here is going to be. Uh, I'm going to define the theta c of xd as max of fx transpose t plus c. day in 1 to r. Maybe I should put a 0 here. Yeah. I will put a 0 here and I am going to define g0 of x identically 0. So, g0 of x is 0 and g1 to gr is of course the usual g1 to gr that we have in the optimization problem. Okay. Do we recognize some terms from here and there? Is there some, some similarities between what we have here and what we have here? So I have the gradient of fx transpose d term here. I have the gradient of gjx transpose d here within the maximization. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect the terms together because alpha is very small. After some arguments, I can write it as the small o of alpha. So all of this can be done primarily because the small o of alpha is very small. Like it's negligibly small. So then we can rearrange the terms. And uh, the arguments are not that straightforward, but, but it can be argued from this expression. You can come to this particular expression where theta c is defined here. Okay, and in some so in some situation, this is what the first derivative equivalent of this non-differentiable penalty function looks like. This is the first derivative equivalent of the penalty function. <coughs> Now, how would you run the iteration? How would you run the gradient descent algorithm here, given that this is what the, uh, the first derivative looks like? Uh, well, it's not the first derivative only. It's first derivative transpose d. So this transpose d makes it a scalar quantity. This is actually a scalar quantity. So now we are going to convert this into an optimization problem. And in order to compute the D that minimizes this whole thing, because that's what we wanted to do in gradient descent as well. We wanted to minimize, we wanted to find a D that minimizes the first order Taylor series, not the first order Taylor series, but the first term of the first order Taylor series. So we'll do the same thing. So we want to minimize this particular value and then convert them, convert it into an optimization problem. So I want to minimize theta c of xd. And this gives me the following optimization problem, d star. No, I don't want to say d star. So I want to solve the following problem. I want to minimize uh, gradient of fx transpose d plus half d transpose hd 
such that g j of x plus is less than equal to 0 for all j. Oh, uh, uh, actually, there should be not less than equal to 0, less than equal to c, because I have the Yeah, that looks correct. And here, D is in Rn, and C is in R. So remember, we want to do the minimization. Oh, OK, I'll let you guys write. OK, so we are doing a minimization with respect to d of some function that is itself a maximization over some other expression. So it's a min-max problem. It's not just a minimization problem. So whenever you have a problem of this type, you have a min-max problem, what you want to do is introduce an auxiliary variable. This is known as an auxiliary variable. And you can convert it into a, a constrained minimization problem. So this was an unconstrained minimization problem with a min-max objective function. What I have done is I have converted it into a constrained optimization problem, but with an auxiliary variable. And we have two variables here, right? One is d, which is the original descent direction that I wanted to find. And there is this other variable c that is sitting here, which is also appearing in the optimization in the objective function, as well as in the constraint. Now, can someone tell me if this looks like a convex problem or not? Is this convex in the variables? Remember that there are two variables here, d and c. Is the objective function convex in D? Uh, is the objective function convex in C? And then is, are the constraints linear in D and linear in C? That's what we want to identify. What do you think? So let's, let's look at it. Oh, I, I, of course, haven't mentioned that there is an h here, and the h has to be positive definite, So, which has always been the case throughout this course. So I kind of implicitly assume that h is positive definite. I know that c is strictly positive as well. And it's actually, it's sufficiently large. So if I look at the objective function, it's linear in c, and it's quadratic in D, and then I have a linear term in D. So this is objective function is convex in D and C. If I look at the constraint, I have a constant, gj of x. I have a term that is uh, linear in D, and then I have a constraint. I mean, the other term is also linear in C. In fact, I can move it on the other side, and I can write it as minus C equals to 0 for all j. So I have a convex objective function with linear constraints. Can I solve this optimization problem? We can apply manifold suboptimization method to solve this problem, right?
OK. So what we have done so far is we had the original constraint optimization problem. We converted into it into a penalty function, fx plus cpx. And we found that if I could solve the unconstrained minimum of fx plus cpx, I can find the solution to the original problem. Now the issue was this penalty function, fx plus cpx, this was a non-differentiable function. So I needed to come up with some approach for figuring out what the descent direction is going to be. And then I kind of realized that the first order term in the Taylor series looks something like this, theta c of x comma d. And I want to minimize, I want to find the d that minimizes this first order variation, first order term in the Taylor series expansion. Now, this minimization problem is actually not just a minimization problem. We are doing minimum over d, maximization over a bunch of functions, which is linear in d. So that creates a problem, because I don't know. So far, we haven't learned how to solve a min-max problem. It turns out, after thinking for a bit of time, that actually this min-max problem is equivalent to solving this minimization problem where I'm minimizing over not just d, but also an auxiliary variable c that satisfies with this objective function and with this constraint set. Uh, turns out that the objective function is uh, quadratic in d and linear in c. So it's a convex, co convex function in the objective. And it's also a linear function in the constraint. And we know how to solve this problem because we have studied conditional gradient method, gradient projection method, manifold suboptimization method, and barrier method for solving problems of this type. OK, so this problem can be solved. This quadratic programming problem can be solved. Of course, the ideal way to solve this quadratic programming problem would be either using a barrier method or using a, a manifold suboptimization method. Yes, please. Oh, there should be a gradient here. Yeah, sorry. I mean, fx is a, make a, please make a note there is a gradient here. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, any other question? C is always uh, a scalar, like one value? It's, yeah, it's just one value. C is always it's a scalar. Always one value, one auxiliary. Right, right. <clears throat> so remember, for j equals to 0, remember, j, for j equals to 0, g0 of x is identically 0. So what does that mean? g0 of x plus gradient of g0 of x transpose d minus c is less than or equal to 0. Uh, now this is equal to 0. This is equal to 0. So what that means is your c is actually greater than or equal to 0. Because for j equals to 0, this constraint is equivalent to saying that c is greater than or equal to 0. So even though c is a scalar, uh, it's actually a non-negative scalar, not just a, it cannot take a negative value because of the constraints. Okay, so at every xk, you have to solve this problem to get dk. And this approach is known as sequential, sequential quadratic programming. So you start with x0, then compute d naught using qp at x naught. Let me call this as qp at x. 
and then you have x1 equals to x0 plus alpha d0 and then you compute d1 using qp x1 and then you continue this process again and again. Okay. So this is something that is, uh, of course, uh, so we have looked at a lot of different optimization algorithms and every time we come up with an optimization algorithm, what we have is we have this big optimization problem, we convert it into a simpler optimization problem, we can solve it by very simple algorithms and then use the output of the simple optimization algorithms to update the output of the, like, uh, of the, uh, outer iteration and we continue this process again and again. This was the case in barrier method. This was the case in uh, augmented Lagrangian method. And this is also the case here in the sequential quadratic programming method. The only benefit of this method is in the sequential quadratic programming at every point of time, you have to solve a quadratic programming problem and you can come up with very fast algorithms to solve quadratic programming problems. Even though you have inequality constraints, you can actually solve it pretty quickly and in a very robust fashion. Robust fashion means that if something is going wrong, you will get to know about it very quickly. Um, so easier to debug. What I'm going to do in the next class is We'll talk a little bit more about the sequential quadratic programming, which is how do, you, how do you solve this problem again and again? Like because you are solving this problem iteratively, are there heuristics you could use to speed up the execution of the quadratic programming problem? So that's one part that I'm going to touch upon. And the second part I'm going to touch upon is how do you uh, compute the value of alpha? Like what's the way to uh, pick alpha. So those are the two things that is still missing right now in our description. So we'll talk about it in the next class. And then we'll talk about uh, another method. So this is Wednesday's class, yes. So I'm going to talk about some other penalty methods for solving a uh, quadratic programming problem. And after that, so in that particular algorithm, we'll come up with some algorithms to solve the optimization problem, but the convergence properties of that algorithm depends on what is known as a Banach contraction mapping theorem. So next Monday, I'm going to talk about contraction mapping theorem, which is one of the most important theorems in, in functional analysis, which has applications in optimization. So uh, that is going to be a fairly mathematical topic, uh, contraction mapping theorem but it's a very, very versatile tool in order for you to prove that something converges. And in, within the optimization algorithms community, that, al that theorem is frequently invoked to prove that whatever algorithm you are coming up with converges to the optimal solution. So that's why that, al that, that theorem is important, contraction mapping theorem is important, and we'll talk about the proof next Monday. Um, so that's all I have. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, oh, that's right. Uh, I'll send an alternate time for the office hours on Wednesday. What time would work? Wednesday, 3 to 4. Would that be okay? So office hours are on Friday, 3 to 4. I'm assuming Wednesday, 3 to 4 would be okay for most of you. Okay, good. So Wednesday, 3 to 4. I'll send out an announcement soon. Thank you for reminding me that. Give me one minute.